Imperial College in London, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm an engineer, uh, so I'm a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, which is equivalent to um, the National Academy of Engineering in the United States. So this is very much um, a personalised view of uh, uh, some of the engineering uh, uh, concepts in relation to synthetic biology. And to just, um, if you like, put this in context, um, Paul Fremont and I, Paul's going to speak, have been working on synthetic biology for about four or five years now, um, and uh, we've run an IGEM team for the last, uh, the last three years. But as I say, I want to emphasize this is very much a personalized view of some of these issues. Uh, some of these early slides you will have um, probably seen before in different guises, but um, you know, it is the whole concept of what can we do here in relation to applying engineering principles etc. And uh, so in engineering, we look at modularity, we look at standardization, we characterize parts, and we do quite a lot of modeling. And what we're trying to do here in terms of synthetic biology, certainly from an engineering point of view, uh, is to apply some of these concepts to the development of, uh, as you can see here, um, biological parts, devices, and systems. And what I want to stress here is that um, uh, I would say pretty definitely that um, uh, all engineering systems, whether it's uh, uh, going from a radio to a jumbo jet, are all based upon this concept of taking standardized parts, standardized devices, and standardized systems. And so this kind of gives you the concept. This is actually a, a slide that I managed to uh, get from Google. So this is a, a, a kit that used to be available in the, in, in the UK uh, for schoolboys. Uh, where you could construct things like, as you can see, this ship. Uh, but it, the Meccano uh, kits were based upon the concept of uh, standardized parts. So let's just have a look at um, you know, some of the uh, very standard uh, engineering parts. So here's a toggle switch. Chris Voigt, of course, uh, published quite a nice review paper in, in this, sort of, this sort of area. And here's... Um, uh, uh, I think his name is either Jim or Phil, but he's at Boston University. His concept of the, uh, the idea of a toggle switch uh, represented in terms of biology, uh, where you can see that what's happening here is that with the biostable switch, you go from no DNA damage to actually creating a biofilm. So this is an implementation of uh, a toggle switch. Another uh, important uh, engineering uh, part, if you like, is the so-called basic inverter. And I'll be coming back to this, but this is typically implemented in engineering uh, in terms of, for example, uh, an, operational, an operational amplifier, as shown here. And here, again from Chris Voigt's paper, uh, is uh, the implementation of that. And you can see that the basic idea of an inverter is simply represented in terms of this characteristic that is, as you increase the input, the output decreases, so you get, you get the inverter concept. And what I'll show you later on uh, is that this basic concept of the inverter is actually used uh, to build uh, an oscillator, which, of course, is one of the very standard and important uh, uh, engineering parts. So, for example, in my watch here, uh, the, uh, the quartz uh, crystal in my watch acts as a clock, and uh, so an oscillator is a form of clock, and that's, again, one of the standard building blocks. Uh, finally, and I'm going to come back to all of these things as we go through, uh, there, is, there has already been, uh, actually during SB4, quite a lot of talk about uh, different types of logic gates, and this is something that uh, we are uh, interested in from a research point of view. So I've just shown here the kind of representation one would typically see in engineering of an AND gate and an OR gate, but again, I'm going to come back to this. So these are some you know, basic engineering uh, parts, if you like. Now let's have a look at uh, some of the concepts behind uh, systematic design. As I've already said, the, the whole basis of engineering design is that you work on standard parts, standard leading to standard devices, and then leading to standard systems. For, for example, you know, if you sort of look at the way in which a BMW car is constructed, all these different models of BMW cars, actually when you really get down to it, are actually very similar because they use the same parts and the same devices and then they produce the same model, they produce different models which are different systems. And so, from an engineering point of view, 
one considers these three uh, tenets of engineering design as being extremely important. The concept of abstraction, the concept of uh, being able to decouple the various stages in terms of the development of the system, and then uh, the whole concept of standardization and international standards. Um, could we put the lights back down again, do you think? Would you mind? Or do people want to take notes? Is that the problem? Okay. So, as I've already said, built from a, a hierarchy of standard parts, devices, and systems. And this is very important. Uh, in engineering, the characteristics of every single part, device, and system are extremely well defined. I mean, you wouldn't expect to go to a, a handbook on a particular type of part for it, for it not to be 100% accurate in terms of the representation. And I guess one of the things I would argue in terms of uh, synthetic biology, and again, I'm going to come back to this, is that it is absolutely essential for an engineering standpoint if you're going to use this concept, so this concept of standard parts and registry, etc., that these parts are absolutely fully characterized and are totally 100% uh, dependable. Um, right, so um, when we think about uh, synthetic biology and the concept of biobricks, uh, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows now, or knew before, I mean, what we're talking about in, in terms of parts are these modified sections of bacterial DNA, typically, and these lead to the devices by inserting them into E. coli or uh, uh, other biological uh, chassis, etc. And one of the areas that we and other people work on are logic gates. And the reason why we're interested in logic gates, for example, is because they can perform standard tasks in terms of a system, so you can develop things like counters and, you know, ultimately simple forms of uh, biological computers. So let's just have a look at um, some of the uh, key building parts uh, for uh, how we do this. So some of the key building parts are modeling. So we do a lot of modeling. I'm going to come to the underlying uh, underpinning technology. Quality assurance in terms of moving synthetic biology into engineering and then into the industrial domain is incredibly important. And uh, we, we, you know, we saw some of that uh, yesterday in terms of the biofuels talks engineering design, and then applications. So if we just look at modeling, uh, these are some examples of um, the types of modeling that can be used. So flux modeling, for example, looking at the stability. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in terms of living system Stability is incredibly important from the point of view of engineering, uh, protein networks, etc. We look at underpin underpinning technology. So there's going to be talks this afternoon about microfluidics, um, DNA synthesis, of course, is an important underlying technology here, and uh, we already saw in the previous se session, actually, uh, a bit of discussion about the companies in involved in this. And uh, I, I, I would submit that imaging of various kinds is going to become very important in this area as well. So on the quality assurance front, uh, looking at uh, fabrication, for example, in terms of engineering design is, is very important. I, and I didn't go to the session, but I believe that Drew Endy uh, talk to you in some detail about, uh, about the concept of fabrication. And, and I, again, would submit that a lot of the fabrication techniques that are used in modern electronics may well have a significant application here in terms of synthetic biology. Okay, so in terms of the what I loosely call the Imperial College approach to this, to synthetic biology, we base a lot of our work on the concept of the engineering cycle which goes from specification through design modeling to implementation and then testing and validation. And you go around this cycle. So I want to spend a, little, a few minutes just talking about this. So first of all, specification. So when you're designing a uh, system, typically one comes up with specifications. So the first step in any, any engineering project is to draw up the specification of the system. And so what I'm saying here is that, you know, from an engineering perspective, if you want to apply these kind of approaches to synthetic biology, these are the kind of steps that you, you need to go through. So what do we want to build? What, it, what performance do we expect? These are the kind of questions you typically ask. And what are the design constraints? Now, if, in terms of specifications, at the moment, I would argue there are kind of two classes of, uh, of biological engineering projects. One where we are sort of rewriting, simplifying the existing organism to eliminate superfluous functions, and 
you know, one example of that would be the simplified cell, the sort of thing that uh, I presume George Church is going to talk about this afternoon. The other one is the complete design, so combining existing sequences into something uh, totally new. If we look at design, um, the design phase uh, has moved actually away from the wet lab to some extent to looking at uh, things in terms of paper on the computer, so design on the computer, and people have talked about uh, sending these um, uh, new sequences off to, uh, off to the, um, the gene foundry. question is, are biobricks available in the registry? How can sections of DNA be combined? Uh, do we need to build some more biobricks? And these are typically things that one talks about in terms of iGen projects. Standards. Now, standards in engineering are, are incredibly important. I mean, you really cannot um, uh, build anything without the standard. So I thought I'd put this up because this is the first example, as far as I'm concerned, of an international standard. So this is Sir Joseph Whitworth in 1841 who developed the, the first standard for, as you can see here, bolts. And of course, there are many, many different standard types of bolts. You know, people say, well, bolts, Technology is pretty boring, but if you're flying in a jumbo jet to go home, you know, there are four million parts in a jumbo jet. And, you know, standards in terms of bolts are pretty important if you want these things to fly around the world. And I would submit that standards are incredibly important in terms of synthetic biology as well. And, of course, within the MIT registry, uh, there have been, uh, uh, there, there are attempts, of course, to develop the standard registry in terms of, in term, well, in terms of standards. So one of the key features of the registry is the uh, development of uh, uh, specification sheets or characterization sheets, spec sheets. And here's one example of a part from the registry, which actually we, we used last year. Now, again, just to emphasize this, uh, if you're looking at uh, commercial parts in terms of the development of, say, a digital circuit or something like that, you would absolutely expect these, these data sheets to be 100% accurate. You, you, you work on that assumption. And again, I would, I would uh, submit that in terms of synthetic biology, uh, we have to get to this point. I mean, this is not uh, necessarily very easy, but you know, if we're going to move the field forward in terms of engineering concepts and the, an engineering approach, these specification sheets have to get to a point where they're 100% accurate. And we can argue about that. Now, um, a couple of years ago, I wrote, there's a, something called the Asia-European uh, Meeting, which is a, me a, go a governmental meeting, actually, high-level governmental meeting, and I was asked to write a report on standards. So I took the uh, concept of the human physium, going from body right, the whole body right down to genes. And the, these are the standards that are involved in those areas, of which things like DICOM, digital image communication in medicine, is a major international standard adopted by all the major manufacturers. So if you, you know, buy an MR scanner or a CT scanner or something like that, you would absolutely expect it to follow the DICOM standard, and that's been very successful. When we get down here at the, uh, down to the molecular level, to the gene level, which is the sort of area we're interested in here, you can see there's quite a plethora of standards, and indeed ontologies. And it's this area, you know, when we talk about the registry, that really, in my opinion, needs to be resolved uh, we need to really get down to connecting what we're doing in terms of the uh, MIT registry, etc., with what's going on in terms of the international standards at this level of the physium. Okay. Now, our approach, uh, wherever possible, certainly in terms of iGEM, uh, is to uh, try and use standard parts in the registry, if possible. Uh, and the reason for that is, and this applies again to what one does in terms of engineering, is because a lot of effort has gone in to produce hopefully reliable and robust parts. But what we do at the moment is to take the part, so this is a part from a project we were looking at last year, which uh, actually Paul is going to talk about, I think, next. And we took the standard part, we took the spec sheet, but we actually put it through the wet lab again to really check that everything uh, is working properly. And so I would, I would sort of emphasize that at this point in time, uh, it is pretty important, actually, even in terms of uh, the parts in the registry at the moment, to actually do this, because uh, they are not, in the main, 100% reliable. That may sound like heresy, but I think it's reality. And so we checked every single part of this part in much more detail, actually, to make sure that it really did work as it's supposed to work. 
okay, modeling. Now, of course, um, I'm going to talk briefly at the end a bit about uh, transistors. Uh, when Schottky et al. were developing the original transistor, they didn't have the benefit of modeling. And this is a very powerful tool which we all have now available. So computer modeling is very important. So um, it's an essential step now in terms of the design of, I would argue, any biological function. You know, you don't always know the range of parameters, but you can start to fill in the model uh, as you go along. And uh, so you can use biobrick characterization if that's available. Or you can, people use stochastic or differential equation modeling uh, to look at uh, how, for example, biobricks go together. And Shui Lu is going to talk a bit more about modeling a bit later on. So here's a very simple example of a model that we would use uh, in engineering. So this is a van der Poel equation. Van der Poel equations are used quite extensively in engineering design because they allow you to look at different types of oscillations, going here from a simple harmonic motion oscillation with a phase plane diagram through to nonlinear oscillations. And you can uh, actually model quite a wide range of, of uh, oscillations using a simple van der Poel. So this is the simplest, if you, one of the simplest ways in which you can model. But it does give you insight, and we use this basic approach in our iGEM 2006 entry where we were producing a, uh, a biological oscillator. And you can see that uh, when you look at these diagrams, under certain conditions we got oscillations, under other conditions we didn't. And the question is, why? And the point is that uh, using modeling techniques like van der Poel or uh, differential equations, you can get at what you need to do to the parameters to make the device work properly. And indeed, if it doesn't work properly, how you correct it. So this is, uh, 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 again, something I'm going to go into in slightly more detail a bit later on. Uh, but this is an example of uh, an AND gate which we've been developing, a two-input AND gate, these are the differential equations upon which it is based. And so this represents the kind of modeling that we, 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 we typically would do at the moment. Now, what I'm going to show you in a second is that, uh, in my opinion, we need to go to the next stage, which is that in engineering design, you typically wouldn't use just standard differential equations because they are differential equations. Uh, what you would do is typically go to the uh, step of converting differential equations into algebraic equations. And the reason why you do that is to modularize the system and to use what I would call a transfer function approach. So here's an example. This is, so, this is uh, actually a rather successful model we, we developed. We worked for many years on looking at um, blood pressure control. So this is up at the physiological level. And when you look at the detail of this model, all these S's in here are Laplace transforms. And the reason why one goes into Laplace transforms is because you can modularize the model, but also the Laplace transforms convert the uh, differential equations into linear algebraic equations. And uh, uh, so Shui Lu and I and others are now working on doing this conversion, and he will talk a bit more about that. Just to show that these models actually work at the physiological level, uh, what you can see here is that these models are able to uh, in this case, uh, model uh, blood pressure dynamically. So the dotted line, I think I can read, I can read this. Yes, this is the, the solid line is the real variation in terms of blood pressure, and the dotted line is the model that's tracking it. And so, you know, one is able to develop models at the physiological level, which are really quite accurate. And I would submit that use, use of Laplace transforms for synthetic biology is an important step. Okay, implementation. Okay. Now, uh, again, this has been talked about quite a lot over the last um, uh, few days, but uh, you know, now we have uh, the ability to design these DNA sequences really quite quickly, to stick them in the mail, to send them off to people like GeneArt, and hopefully, as Sven made the point about this at the, in the last session, you know, to get them back in the post after about three weeks. But nevertheless, gene foundries uh, are offering a range of services and allow you to optimize the sequence. So, you know, we're moving sort of from the wet lab in this sense into uh, being able to design these things on the computer. So here's um, an example, you know, you pop it in a box, you get it back, back in a box from the gene foundry. And in fact, this is what happens in terms of our iGEM uh, submissions. You know, we have worked, we've worked with GeneArt for the last couple of years, getting the sequences back. Testing and validation. Okay, so, of course, now talking about the wet lab, uh, there are lots of uh, 
underlying technologies that I've already shown, microarrays, flow cytometry, etc., which allow us to be able to uh, validate the systems uh, really quite effectively. And this was, and it's important to stress this, this was unimaginable about a decade ago, but now all this kit is available to be able to do this. So let me give some examples here. First of all, taking the basic inverter that I talked about earlier, okay, and to just show you know, how some of these engineering principles fit in. Now, typically what one does in terms of inverter is you set these two resistors to be equal, and uh, typically you set them to be about one uh, K ohm or above for the stability of the circuit, and that then gives you the inversion. So that's what you do in terms of electronics. Now, the underlying principle in terms of engineering uh, is shown here in terms of this feedback diagram. And uh, in order to look at stability uh, of oscillations, you need to apply what's called the Nyquist criterion, which says that uh, the feedback here in terms of the negative feedback system, the gain has got to be at least one, and there's got to be a phase shift of 180 degrees. So if you look at uh, this inverter here, it looks at first sight that if you put a bit of feedback into this, uh, into the electronics, but equally into the synthetic biology, that you should produce an oscillation. But it doesn't, actually. And there are two reasons for this. Uh, and, um, sorry, this is shown here. So you would imagine uh, that this is the ring oscillator that, you know, is in some of the standard literature for synthetic biology. You would imagine from the Nyquist criterion that, oops, that one of these uh, uh, inverters would produce the oscillation. But the problem is you have noise in the system, and so you need at least two. But then the other key issue here uh, is that why there are three in here is because you need time delay around the loop in order to uh, specify the oscillation frequency. So this is actually, you know, it's a very good step forward, but for an engineering point of view, it's rather crude because it's difficult to control the frequency and indeed the amplitude because the frequency is largely dependent on the time delay around the loop. And, you know, this comes out really very quickly and clearly once you start to look at the Nyquist criterion, etc. So here is the repressor which is um, a very important step forward, but nevertheless, from an a, uh, oscillator point of view, unstable, noisy, and inflexible. Okay, so what you need here really is sustained oscillations, high signal-to-noise ratio. These are some of the specs that one would need to impose, and controllable oscillations in terms of uh, both amplitude and frequency. Uh, so what we did was to design an oscillator which was based on large populations of molecules, uh, to reduce the noise. So this is just one approach to how one would design an oscillator. Uh, so oscillation is due to dynamic uh, populations, and we were able to, although I'm not going to go into this in detail this morning, characterize the model in some detail. And we based this on a predator-prey approach, molecular predator-prey, uh, which uses the Lotka-Volterra model. This is essentially, in simple terms, represented by predators, namely foxes and preys, uh, namely the rabbits, you can represent this in terms of simple uh, differential equations to, to show how the oscillation works. So, you know, as the rabbit population builds up, to use the analogy, the foxes eat the rabbits as the population decreases, uh, then you get the oscillation occurring. And we were able, using this approach, to uh, control not only amplitude, uh, but also frequency. So this is um, not a perfect example, but nevertheless it's an example that uh, uh, works in terms of stability and the ability to control uh, both amplitude and frequency. Now if we turn to logic gates, uh, what we've been looking at in uh, some detail now is the development of NAND gate. And we've based this uh, actually on uh, what is called the HRP system. So you can see that this is a, a system which uh, effectively relates to, um, to leaves and uh, 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 affecting leaves. And uh, this is shown here in terms of uh, the basic system. This allows us to be able to control this system in significantly better detail than we uh, are able to do with other types of gates. And so what we did here was to separate out uh, the two sides of the, um, of the process so now we have two promoters which we can control. And so this means that when we drive one promoter, as shown here, and then the other promoter separately, because they're not synchronized, so this is the equivalent of ones and zeros, 
we don't get an output of one at the output. When they are synchronized in terms of time, then we do get an output. And we can simulate this uh, really very well. And so this just shows the kind of response that we get from the, the two inputs. Uh, this is, uh, at the moment, by no means perfect, because what one is looking for is a much sharper characteristic. But nevertheless, it is um, something that we can uh, control much more effectively. And that's shown here in terms of uh, experiments where we are holding one of the, one of the inputs uh, constant, and then we're varying the other input to look at the response of the characteristic, and that's shown over, overall here. And as I say, what we're looking for here is how to optimize the system, both in terms of the actual system but the modeling, to be able to produce a situation where we sort of basically get a flat characteristic which then drops off, or more or less. But the interaction between the modeling and uh, the implementation allows us actually to be able to optimize this, and our latest results look uh, significantly better. Um, the point about this approach, we would argue, is that it is modularized because you know, the output of this part of the device is actually a promoter, which we then feed into the inverter, and that then turns the AND gate into a NAND gate, which, of course, for many computers and counters is the basic building block. Okay, so we see the HRP system as being... Uh, actually a very effective way forward because it allows us to uh, work on modular design. And uh, so these, this is the range of things that we're working on now in relation to the basic HRP system. So not only a two-input two AND gate, but a three-input AND gate, NAND gates, inverters, etc. And as I say, this is taking a synthetic biology approach, but it's a, an approach where we're able to model and uh, to work on this system in the wet lab. Okay, so now finally, just summing up here, uh, I wanted to make a few statements which, again, are very personal. Uh, but I would probably argue quite strongly that uh, if, if we all you know, work for a few years, we're going to get to a position where uh, we may see uh, a new type of industrial revolution uh, coming out of synthetic biology. Now, why do I say this? I say this because... If you read the literature, there are strong parallels, actually, between synthetic biology now and what happened in terms of synthetic chemistry in the 19th century. So here's an example uh, of uh, natural dyes from a market in India. Uh, in 1856, this man, Henry, uh, per William Henry Perkin, actually uh, managed to uh, create the first synthetic dye and actually patented it, and this is the patent from uh, uh, 1856, he then created a factory, actually in North London, and produced the, produced the dye. And that dye was quickly uh, called, given the name of mauve. So mauve uh, didn't exist before uh, 1856. It was the first example of a synthetic dye based upon synthetic chemistry. Probably a much uh, more widely known example of this uh, is Felix Hoffman, who worked for the Bayer Company, and at the end of the 19th century produced aspirin. Uh, synthetically, okay? So these parallels between uh, synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry I think are very important because, you know, this is a controversial area and we're going to see a lot of people criticising us as we go forward and it's important to just hang on to this and to realise that um, in the 19th century, you know, there were equal... If you read the literature, you find equal criticisms made about synthetic chemistry that we're hearing about synthetic biology right now. So it's important to, you know, just remember that. Okay, now finally, just to touch on another issue, and this is very much from an engineering point of view, uh, people often say to me, well, of course, this is all very complex, you know, uh, you know there's lots of interactions in cells that we don't understand, etc. And, what I, and I, of course, that is correct, but what I would argue is that uh, engineering is complex as well. This is a jumbo jet, probably the, almost the one I flew over in from London, this has got four million parts in it, all, right? all of which are standardized, all of which lead to standard devices and standard systems. Just think about how many jumbo jets are flying around. They're not falling out of the sky. I hope the one I'm going back on tonight is not going to fall out of the sky. But, you know, this is all based upon the kind of concepts that we're now promoting for synthetic biology. It's important to remember this. This is a slide from one of our uh, experiments in terms of our, our research. What's important here is just the characteristics. 
Now you can see that in terms of synthetic biology as represented here, uh, there is significant variation in terms of the characteristics. Now again, this is something that we've seen before because uh, when Schock et al. were designing the first transistors, there were these kind of variations in the characteristics of high levels of noise, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is an example, or actually a photograph, of the first transistor by Schock et al. Now, where we are today, this is February 2008, is Intel have now produced a 2 billion transistor chip. That's the size of my thumb, okay? There are 2 billion transistors on this, on this chip. What's important here uh, is that um, in the process of developing the 2 billion transistor chip, and of course much earlier generations, uh, what the engineers and physicists worked on and were able to achieve was increasing the signal to noise enormously, reducing uh, the variability in terms of the characteristics, etc., until these devices became basically 100% reliable. And that is also in my opinion, a key objective in terms of synthetic biology. And this is a key way in which um, engineering can come to bear in this area. Okay, so finally, concluding remarks. Okay, I would argue quite strongly that we're at a similar point in terms of synthetic biology, etc., where you've got the confluence of engineering and physics on the one hand and biology on the other, uh, that we were at, actually, at the end of the 19th century, and I would argue actually quite strongly that, you know, if this field develops as a lot of us think it will develop, uh, we will see the development of ma major industries which are equivalent to what we saw at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, the automotive industry, the aircraft industry, etc. And as I've said, it's the confluence of engineering and physical science on the one hand with biology, that is, synthetic biology, which will produce or could produce this new industrial revolution. Thank you. <laughs> um, we should probably move on to Paul's talk and then maybe take some questions together because um, Paul's going to... Oh, okay. Well, can, do you want, anybody want to ask me a question? Yeah. So um, I just wanted to comment you, you to comment on something. Like, uh, when we derive models for bio biological systems, they are most of the time nonlinear if we derive them from first principles. But you showed us in your talk that you can do analysis with Laplace transforms and Nyquist diagram, which we know they all only for linear systems. So can you comment on that? How did you derive your linear models? Um, Just from data and You mean the difference between linear and nonlinear? No, no. I mean, um, how did you derive your models? Um, did you derive them from first principles? Sorry, from first principles or just from data fitting? Both. Both. Yeah. And did you find that they were linear? No, they're, it's, it's, they're not linear. I mean, a combination of... Well, I mean, you know, generally speaking, I'm sure you, you wouldn't know this, but, I mean, generally speaking, most systems are nonlinear by definition, okay? But what you try and do is to linearize them to, to as much as possible um, by using Laplace transform techniques in terms of the slide I showed. You can then take some parts which are linear and then you can also include nonlinear parts, and that's the sort of way forward here. But so you found that just linearizing was good and, I mean, was sufficient for what you were aiming at. Um, it was a good approximation of the nonlinear model. So you can well, use linear Well, I mean, linear it, you tools. can't generalize like that. It's, it dep in terms of for a specific, specific example, things, yes. But, 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 but you know, but it, so what one tries to do is to linearize things as much as possible. And when that doesn't work, then you start sticking in nonlinear elements. Okay. Okay. These things are never perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, of course. But that's what I mean. You, you linearize it. As, I mean, sorry to keep going on about this, but in physics and engineering, you know, you linearize things as much as you possibly can. And if you can't, you know, if it goes outside the bounds of, you know, reality, if I can put it that way, then you start putting in some nonlinear elements. Yeah. Okay, you ready, Paul? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 